Well, um, I'm really pleased to be in, invited here and uh, thank all the organizers in here in Palo. And, uh, um, and anyway, great crowd and thank you very much for the opportunity. So I'd like to um, talk about a set of topics that I find very appealing. Uh, and I'll spend a certain amount of time today motivating, uh, motivating what I want to do. And you know, I'm not quite sure how far I'll get to, uh, get to by the end of the week. Um, there's sort of an infinite amount to say. But um, I, I hope to give you a, a bit of a flavor of several different approaches. So um, I'll describe the problem in some detail uh, as we go along. Uh, but what I find appealing about it is that, you know, many different parts of mathematics come in. So, I mean, there's really uh, input from analysis and geometry and, and also, you know, geometric analysis, synthetic geometry, algebraic geometry, uh, um, you know, low-dimensional topology. I mean, it really has a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of lovely connections. So I, I'll try to impart some of that, but I'll sort of obviously have my own biased perspectives. And um, so today I'm going to give... Um, you know, I think it'll be uh, uh, some background, and, and I'll try to, um, you know, talk about the more classical parts of the subject. And so it's it'll be, um, well, we'll see, uh, a rather different flavor than what I'll be talking about later in the week. But um, I think it's important to cover various different grounds on this. And um, well, I'll try not to lie too much, you know, about how I uh, describe things. But of course, if I lie too much, you know, the sun's going to go out. So. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's see. So I want to um, say a little bit what I mean by uh, a metric with a conic singularity. So fortunately, Alex gave me the perfect introduction. Uh, you know, and so you have a, a bit of intuition about these, but I'll describe what I mean a little bit more specifically. And as he mentioned, I'll, I'll be interested in surfaces with uh, more general conic singularities. So, okay, now I got to get used to this chalk, which I was told um, there's some pricks too. So, uh, yeah, let's see, so hold on, no. Scott, you're wrong. I'll use the end of the corners. I like corners, but it's still not working. Uh, no, that, uh, uh, here we go. Okay. I think that's going okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so conic singularities. So um, one can talk about these um, in sort of generality in higher dimensions and in surfaces, and I'll, I'll define what I mean by a, a conic metric um, uh, initially, and then I'll specialize to surfaces. Um, so, conic metric. So, um, the model cone is just a warp product, so it looks like uh, G, which looks like dr squared plus r squared times h, where I have a uh, a cross section ZH, and this is a compact, let's say, a compact smooth manifold. And what this looks like is just exactly this. Here's a copy of Z, and it's whatever Riemannian manifold you wish. And then you just sort of cone it off so as R gets large, this is going out, and as R gets small, this is coming down to a conic tip. Okay, so nothing too mysterious about this. Uh, more generally, we'll talk about. Um, I'll just refer to them as conic metrics, but asymptotically conic metrics, it'll be some sort of perturbations of these. So there'll be some sort of metric perturbation, and I might think of this plus higher order terms. So if you like, just uh, adding on extra tensors that decay as R goes to zero. Okay, so that's sort of the general class of things. Now, um, when we talk about surfaces, there's only one choice. So of course, if this is supposed to be n-dimensional, then Z is n minus one dimensional. And if the ambient space is two-dimensional, the cross-section is called the link as a circle. And the only invariant of it is, well, you know, all circles are isometric once you fix the length. So there's exactly one real parameter, which is the length of that circle, which is the cone angle. Okay, so in one dimension, in two dimensions for surfaces, I can write these in a slightly special way. I can write them as dr squared plus and maybe I'll write this as alpha squared, r squared, d theta squared, where here alpha is any number greater than zero. Okay, so theta is on the regular circle of uh, circumference two pi, and alpha is greater than zero, and so the cone angle here is uh, two pi times alpha. So I'm allowing cone angles of any, any positive uh, number. Okay, so this picture looks exactly right, so a cone angle that's strictly less than 2 pi, I've made the circle a little bit small, and uh, when I take the cone over it, it looks sort of like a decreased version of Euclidean space. 
when the cone angle is exactly 2 pi, well, of course, Euclidean space itself is a conic space. It just, the cone singularity is kind of invisible and it's, it doesn't really play a role, it's arbitrary. And then I can let the cone angle be greater than 2 pi and then you can't visualize it anymore. You can think of it as something which is wrapping around a bit. But in general, I'm interested in, in real cone angles and uh, so Alex talked about some of the milestones where we have cone angles, maybe pi, 2 pi, 4 pi, and so on. Those play very interesting roles. They actually, one has a little bit more rigidity there, but uh, uh, those are just special cases of this general construction. Okay, so that's, uh, this is, I'm gonna do that, and this guy goes, okay. Um, okay, so now here's my general problem. So uh, given, uh, let's say, uh, M, and I'll maybe put a conformal class on it. See, this is a compact Riemann surface. Okay, I want to choose a divisor. I'll just let the, um, a disjoint collection of points. P1 through PK be a disjoint collection of points set of points on M. And I'm going to choose uh, parameters alpha 1, alpha K. Okay. Uh, and then what I want to do is I'd like to find a metric G. So this is in the conformal class C, okay, such that um, G has a conic singularity Uh, at PJ with angle 2 pi alpha J. J goes from 1 to K. Okay, so in other words, whatever the surface, I'm always looking at compact surfaces, by the way. I have a collection of points, and I want to find somehow metrics that have... Um, own angles. Well, if I just specify this problem, that's not very interesting or hard. Namely, it's easy to find metrics in a given conformal class and to modify them a bit to have a certain cone angle is not uh, very interesting either, not very hard. So um, I want to say G has constant curvature. So in other words, I can think of this as the uniformization problem in the category of, uh, of, of these types of cone metrics. Okay, so uh, that's a problem that's been around for 150 years. I mean, in some sense, people have thought about this for a long, long time. Uh, I'll talk about what's known, and, and so for certain cases, we're going to see that there's a radical difference when the cone angles are less than 2 pi or greater than 2 pi. Uh, things behave very differently, geometrically, analytically, and so on. The story is understood and a little bit surprising in some cases when the cone angles are all less than 2 pi. When the cone angles are greater than 2 pi, then there's, uh, well, like in all of these problems, you have to specify, are you looking at negative, zero, or po positive curvature? Negative and zero curvature is, in fact, easy. There are still some interesting aspects, but um, the existence problem is pretty easy, and I'll, I'll give you the full solution today. The spherical case is hard, and in some sense, the answer is still uh, not quite known. In fact, it's rather far from known, surprisingly. So I'll, I'll be describing that this week, you know, what's known and what are the various approaches that people have used to study this. Um, but anyway, there's the problem, okay? Now, let me just say a little bit about motivations. Um, so why spend so much energy? Well, it's, you know, there's an infinite amount you can say about surfaces, and this is, you know, yet another whole class of problems. Um, I, I want to uh, motivate it a couple of different ways. So first of all, motivations. So one is, is that, uh, as I already mentioned the words, there's sort of a general class of, you know, uh, problems um, of finding canonical metrics. And I want to think that this is a problem of finding canonical metrics on uh, singular spaces. 
Okay, so a canonical metric, I mean, that's a little bit of a vague term, but, you know, we're interested in constant curvature metrics or, you know, Einstein metrics or something like this, and you can look in every dimension in every category of space, you know, what's the most reasonable natural metric that you expect to just find a, a few of them or, you know, a finite dimensional family of them. Now, you know, why look on singular spaces? And, you know, I think the argument, uh, my kind of message, is that singular spaces are pretty natural. They come up... Um, in some sense, just as often, if not more, than smooth manifolds. And so even if you're just interested in smooth manifolds, you often encounter singular spaces as sort of, and when I say singular, I'll, I'll specify what sort of singularities. I'm not looking at sort of Cantor sets or, you know, wild singularities. I'm looking at spaces that have stratified, sort of well-regulated singularities. Um, so, you know, these come up just as often as smooth manifolds. And for example, if you take a, you know, a Morse stratification, take a Morse function, you look at its various levels, uh, most of its levels are smooth manifolds, but every once in a while you have to cross a singular level and it has a nice stratification and understanding that stratification is a, you know, classical well-known thing, but you get into a new category of spaces. So, you know, there are many similar constructions in topology where you just are sort of naturally led to singular spaces. Um, algebraic geometry, obviously, algebraic varieties, compactifications of uh, uh, locally symmetric spaces, you know, I can give you many, many natural examples of singular spaces. And so part of the goal is to, you know, develop tools of geometric analysis that work on singular spaces, just as, you know, we have a lot of familiar tools that work on smooth compact manifolds. Okay? So um, that's one sort of thing. Now, this is kind of the lowest dimensional version of, a, uh, of, of this problem. So singular spaces, I mean, well, there are actually some interesting singular one-dimensional objects, namely networks of curves, and there's some nice problems there. But this is sort of, you know, in terms of uh, bringing in uh, uh, surface geometry, this is the first uh, interesting case. Now, this particular problem actually has um, two interesting extensions, um, you know, let's say it's uh, part of sort of several interesting problems. So one is, is it's the lowest dimensional uh, example of um, a problem, a well-known problem in a complex or algebraic geometry of a problem in complex algebraic geometry, which is a finding Kähler-Einstein metrics. And uh, so many of you may know this has been a subject of, you know, great interest in and in work over the past uh, many decades. And there was a big... Um, uh, success not long ago, sort of finally completing the last case. And it's, you know, unlike um, um, uh, some other problems, you cannot always find a solution. And we're going to see that here, too. So there's going to be a certain, uh, and there was emerged as a called uh, stability condition in algebraic geometry, case stability. And it turned out that um, um, you can only find a solution of that problem when you're case stable. Uh, so this is actually the very lowest dimensional case where you see that phenomenon. And from that point of view, it's interesting. There's a, a complicated obstruction, okay? Um, so here's another example that goes back to certainly the 70s with Thurston. So a class of what uh, Thurston called uh, cone manifold. And so, I don't know, it's kind of bad terminology because he wasn't thinking of just isolated conic singularities, but he was thinking of constant curvature spaces, which he built synthetically, sort of this GX type construction. And you have spaces that have stratified singularities. So he was thinking, obviously, of the three dimensional case primarily, but one can define this in higher dimensions, where you, know, you might have a hyperbolic structure away from some singular locus, and there's some sort of branching or some sort of conic behavior as you go around these co dimension two singularities, and you might have higher co dimension singularities. Okay? And it turned out that these were a rather uh, important tool in sort of his approach to sort of uh, uh, geometrization and, uh, and putting um, hyperbolic metrics on, uh, on certain manifolds. And uh, so he had an approach which, again, was synthetic, but these have, have emerged as sort of interesting tools. And then slightly more generally, you can just ask for um, some sense of a very natural problem of, you know, find, uh, you know, find um, uh, singular Einstein metrics. And when I say singular, I mean sort of with a very specified class of singularities. These often arise as uh, sort of boundary points on the space of smooth Einstein metrics. Okay? So I don't want to belabor this too much, but just to say that uh, the types of techniques and ideas um, I'm going to introduce for this problem uh, can be used in all of these things, or generalizations that can be used, and this is sort of a good test case for that. Okay, okay so um, now let me point out that 
you know some examples of these things just off the bat. And in fact, well, Alex gave us a lot of examples in the last uh, lecture. Let me give you one other uh, sort of general class of examples, which is very closely related to what he did. So let's suppose I take um, uh, M2, G2 to be any smooth compact surface, compact constant curvature. So it could be uh, flat, spherical, or hyperbolic, right? And so obviously with the hyperbolic case, there's a lot of examples. If I take uh, F from M1 to M2, which is a branched cover, right? and I pull back the metric, I let G1 be F pull back G2, then I'm going to get a metric on whatever M1 is. So M1 might have very high genus because it's a branched cover. Um, and it'll have conic points exactly at the ramification points uh, of the branching. And if I am winding around k times, then the cone angle here is 2 pi k. So in other words, my, my uh, 2 pi, maybe I should call it a, um, L. OK, so if I've wound around, if I've ramified L times, then um, it's un opened up to a cone angle 2 pi L. Okay? Now, this already gives you a little bit of a hint that um, there's going to be some complexity. So if I if I've asked over here, can I find a, uh, uh, a constant curvature metric with specified points and specified cone angles, right? Already we know that that's going to be a bit dicey because if I were to say I want to sort of find a hyperbolic metric with arbitrary points and arbitrary integer multiple of 2 pi cone angles, I'd be asking for a branch cover with sort of a, uh, you know, specified ramification points, you know, and so that's not such, you know, that's a constrained problem. Okay, so okay, so I'll mention various people that um, have worked on this as we go along. But so I'm going to now go to the you know sort of the classical uniformization theory. So first, I want to remind you um, classical uniformization from a PDE point of view. And so it's exactly this one which I'm going to be using. So I'll be talking about other perspectives as we go along. As I said, synthetic geometry even has sort of a, uh, uh, and a very important role to play here and has provided some answers that we can't quite get other ways in, in some cases. But I want to talk about this problem in the case where I have no cone angles. And this is you know, really ancient history. But just to remind you how the, uh, how the um, uh, PDE perspective goes in trying to solve uniformization. Okay. So the problem here is that I have MG0. This is smooth, compact. And I want to find a metric G, which is conformal to G0. So remember I said I wanted to be in the same conformal class. So G looks like E to the 2U G0. The only reason for writing the conformal factor as an exponential is A, I can be sure that it's never negative or zero, just by writing it this way. And secondly, it makes the equation look nicer, right? Otherwise, I could write this in, I could write it as u to the fifth or u to the, you know, whatever, log of u, or, you know, you can write anything here, you get a worse equation. Anyway, if you write it as e to the 2u, then there's a, a classical formula, which is not very hard to derive, that uh, if I take the Laplacian with respect to g naught of u minus the Gauss curvature of g naught plus the Gauss curvature of g times e to the 2u, that's equal to zero. This is just a relationship between any two conformally related metrics. It's pretty easy to derive, and it's called the, uh, the, the Liouville equation. Okay. So, uh, okay, there we have it. And from our point of view, what we're asking is we have a smooth compact surface. I want to find u such that k is equal to a constant. Okay. So in other words, one way you can think about this is somehow find a u so that that coefficient is constant which if I write k is equal to e to the minus 2u times this stuff, then that's like solving some PDE. The other way to think about it is I can sort of fix k, and then I can ask, well, can I find a solution? And um, you'll pretty, pretty quickly see that you're going to run into some constraints. So I'll just remind you, there's a constraint, which is the gauss binet theorem. which just says that you know the integral, so whatever this curvature is, so the integral of k times dA, so this is k sub g 
da sub g, which is the same as k times e to the 2u uh, da g naught. This, this has to be 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of m. OK, so very classical formula. And all that tells you is that if you are in a surface with negative Euler characteristic, then this k had better be a negative number. Okay. Similarly, Euler characteristic zero or positive, you correspondingly have to choose that to be zero or positive. Now, um, the exact n value of k is not so important. So in this case, if I replace u by uh, u plus a constant, I can rescale this. So u plus a constant, the Laplacian is the same. u plus a constant, it gives you an extra factor out here, a positive factor. So in other words, I can always assume that this k, if it's going to be constant, is negative one, zero, or plus one. OK, so OK, so I know what constant to put in there. Now I can ask, can I solve that problem You know, once I've put in the right sign here? OK, so there's this old theorem, of course, that was obviously really a theorem in complex analysis. You can think about, th about this many different ways, but I want to state it purely this way. Um, as solving this equation, I can ask, you know, can I, can I solve this? So the well-known answer is, of course, yes. This always has a solution. You know, if the sine of k is chosen appropriately, and I'll just want to remind you how you do that, OK? So there are three cases. So um, the easiest case, maybe I'll call case 0, is k is equal to 0. Why is that easy? Well, it's simply because the uh, uh, nonlinear term. So anytime you have a nonlinear equation, you're going to presumably have to work harder. When k is equal to 0, that um, exponential is gone. And so I'm just asking to solve the equation, uh, Laplacian, um, Laplacian view. Laplacian view is equal to k naught. Now, one thing which um, somebody should have squawked, and of course I certainly expect questions, is which Laplacian do I, do I mean? So there's always a normalization. And here I mean the Laplacian, which in the standard Euclidean case is d squared dxj squared sum j goes from, well, in this case, 1 to 2. So in other words, it's the Laplacian with the plus d by dx squared, not minus. So that's my normalization I'll use here. OK, well, when does this problem have a solution? So this is classical fact. This has a solution if and only if the integral of k0 is equal to 0. But the Gauss-Binet theorem says that if I have any metric on here, if I have any metric on the surface, g0, then its Gauss curvature has to integrate to 0. So that's just sort of built in. If that's the Gauss curvature function for any metric whatsoever, even if it's a variable function, it has to integrate to 0. And that's a necessary and sufficient condition for this uh, uh, um, this problem to have a solution. Okay. Now, you can modify u like I did before. I can modify it by a constant, u uh, uh, plus or minus a constant. Well, that would correspond to just scaling my surface. Okay. So uh, there's not a natural way to normalize in zero curvature, but in the other cases, there is. Okay. The minus one case is more interesting. Okay. So let's assume that chi of m is less than zero. And what I know now is simply that the integral of k naught is negative. And I need to solve that a problem, so I need to solve Laplace naught of u minus uh, k naught minus e to the 2u is equal to 0. Please. Sure. Well, why would I compute it with respect to a different Laplace <laughs> naught? No. Well, I mean, so I, I didn't mean this being, the, I mean, I just mean that, I mean the Laplacian with the positive sign here. But the curvature, I mean, so what other normalization for the curvature do you mean? Well, it depends on Yeah. Well, okay, so I'm, of course, this is not the Laplacian with respect to a general metric. I've written the Laplacian with respect to a flat metric. And, you know, when I write Laplacian sub zero, I mean the Laplacian with respect to the metric G zero. Okay, which looks like, you know, one over the determinant of G d by dx i of root G d by dx j. G, I, G, I, J. Okay, yeah, so you're absolutely correct there. Okay. okay, so I need to solve this. And so um, I want to introduce you to 
the method has been used, and I'm going to be able to solve this conic metric uh, problem with exactly the same method. So I want to go through it carefully. It's not a very sophisticated method. In fact, if you're trying to solve elliptic, nonlinear elliptic equations, it's, um, as they say, the most boneheaded method you could try. And you know, you're in luck if it works. It rarely works, but in this problem, it works. Okay, so this is called the method of sub and super solutions. And it feels like cheating because you don't have to do very much work. So the method of sub and uh, super solutions. Okay, so you may have seen this, so bear with me. I just wanted to review it here because we're gonna wanna modify this in the singular context. And something that I maybe didn't go, you know, there's a whole yoga, a whole methodology of, of trying to do elliptic theory and, and parabolic and hyperbolic theory in, on singular spaces. And, you know, this is sort of the first example where you see sort of the new features that come out when you try to sort of understand the Laplacian on a conic manifold. Okay, so um, the method of sub and super solutions is, well, let me look at the equation in the following way. Laplacian u is equal to f of x and u. So here x is a local coordinate, so that's just kind of a symbolic for local coordinates. So this is some, it's called a semilinear elliptic equation. Okay, and so the method says the following. Suppose that I can find uh, what are called sub and super solutions. So the definition is that uh, u lower bar is a subsolution if um, Laplacian of u lower bar, so there's this stupid sign convention, which is what leads people to sort of talk about the Laplacian in the other direction, is greater than or equal to f of x u bar. And it's called uh, u upper bar is a super solution if Laplacian of u upper bar is less than or equal to f of x u upper bar. Okay, so that's just a definition for functions. So maybe you can find them, maybe you can't. Obviously, if you found an exact solution, then it's both a sub and super solution. Okay, so this method is based on uh, just the maximum principle, which is a very powerful technique, which again, rarely works, but when it does, it gives you very powerful estimates. Okay, when I say it rarely works, I mean, if you have a system, if you have, you know, I mean, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, examples, it doesn't, all sorts of cases, it doesn't work. Okay, so um, the, the theorem, in this general sense, is that if there exist uh, u bar, which is less than or equal to u upper bar, so sub and super solutions, then there exists an exact solution, a true solution, which is sandwiched in between them. u lower bar is less than or equal to u is less than or equal to u upper bar. Okay. So in other words, if you can somehow find a sub and super solution and they have to satisfy this equality, this sub solution is less than the super solution, then you're done. Okay? Now, you know, these functions don't need to be very complicated. You can just build them out of, you know, functions that you know and love, and that's what we'll do here. Um, but it turns out that uh, that's enough. So uh, the claim is, is that we can do that here. So what I want to do just briefly is, first of all, apply it to this case, to this theorem this uh, Liouville equation, and uh, then secondly, just remind you of the proof of this theorem, okay? This will look very different than the sort of analysis I'll be doing later on, but it's sort of a good basic technique, which is very worth knowing or reviewing, even if you know it well. Okay, so apply this to our problem. Well, so the functions that we know and love the best are constants, and we'd like to say that we can just apply constants as sub and super solutions. Right, which is what we want to do. However, the problem is, is all we know about k naught is that its integral is negative. We don't know that it itself is negative. So there are various ways of handling this, but the first thing we can do is prepare ourselves by finding an initial conformal transformation, namely an initial function, so that uh, we can transform to a function that has uh, um, strictly negative curvature. Okay? So here's my first step, so my preparatory step. So I want to define uh, e to the 2 u naught times g naught. I'm going to call this g1. And I'm going to choose this so that uh, kg1 is strictly negative everywhere in the surface. 
Okay? Now, how do I do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve uh, Laplacian with respect to g naught of u naught is equal to, uh, so this k naught. Now, unlike in the flat case, I can't solve this problem, right? Because this does not have integral zero. So what I want to do is I want to subtract off its average. So k naught bar is just the integral of k naught divided by the area of the surface. Okay, I know I can solve this problem by the same general criterion I talked about. And so then if I take this solution, so now I'm going to define g1 by this formula here. And now if I look at Laplacian u naught minus k naught, and I want to write this as plus k1 times e to the 2 u naught, we know that this is always the transformation rule between the Gauss curvatures of g naught and g1, right? But we know that this thing is equal to, well, by the way I've done these things, this is equal to k naught bar. Right? So therefore, k1, the true Gauss curvature, is equal to k naught, excuse me, yeah, k naught bar times e to the 2u naught. k naught bar was negative, so that's strictly negative. Okay? It's variable, it's not a constant. Right? We don't know what it is, but it has the advantage of being strictly negative. Okay? So that's a nice preparatory step. Okay, and now we can find sub and super solutions really trivially, namely we just take very large negative or positive constants. Consider u lower bar, which is equal to minus a, and u upper bar is equal to plus a. So if I plug this in, I'm going to get, you know, Laplacian naught of minus a, minus k naught, minus e to the minus 2a. Well, this part is gone. This is strictly positive by how I chose things. And this is extremely tiny if a is big enough. So that's going to be greater than zero everywhere. Okay, so there it is. There's my sub-solution. Uh, sub and then similarly, you can check that this is a good super solution. Okay, okay so very easy. I've done no work at all. It doesn't seem like I'm doing analysis. And everything kind of rests in this, this theorem here. Okay, so let me sketch the proof of that. So that's a, uh, you know, a very useful tool, classical fact. It's, you know, finding this sort of the proof written down is not, uh, everybody refers to it without writing down the proof. So let me just give you the proof. Okay, so this is done by an iteration method, okay? Now, what I want to do is first change the equation a little bit. So I have this equation, Laplacian of u. So what I'm trying to do is proof of this general theorem. General PE theorem. So this thing over, I've written over here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to rewrite the equation as Laplacian minus u, Laplacian minus lambda of u is equal to f tilde of x and u, which by definition is just f of x and u minus lambda u. Okay, now why do I do that? Because, well, it's not to make this thing invertible, though when lambda is a positive number, that's invertible. Right, so that's sort of a nice fact. But in fact, it's going to turn out that um, you want a certain property of this. So what I want to choose is I want to choose lambda so large so that this function, f tilde of x and u, is monotone decreasing. Uh, in u. In other words, I want du of f tilde of x and u to be less than or equal to zero. Okay? So why, well, first of all, how do you, why should we be able to do this? Because, of course, you can take on any value, could be up to plus infinity and minus infinity. Well, in fact, all I care about is that this happen for values of u which are in between the sub and super solutions. Okay? So suppose that we have our sub and super solutions. So let me just do this over here. So I have these sub and super solutions, which are, you know, let's say C2 functions so that I can define this pointwise. So I have u bar and u upper bar, that gives me bounds on where f is. And so it's certainly true that, you know, just by compactness of the surface and so on, that I can make this function, I can choose lambda so large so that this is true for any value of u in between u lower bar and u upper bar, because I'm just dealing with a compact set of values there. Okay. 
So I, uh, so I want du f tilde is less than or equal to zero if u lower bar, let's say the infimum of u lower bar is less than or equal to, u is less than or equal to the supremum of u upper bar. Okay, so that's just a bounded range, and I can easily arrange that by choosing lambda large enough. Okay, so now what I do is I'm going to define a sequence. I'm going to let, let's say, u0 be u lower bar. And I'm going to define uj plus 1 iteratively is equal to uh, Laplacian minus lambda inverse f tilde of x uj. Okay, so namely, I just solve the equation Laplacian minus lambda of uj plus 1 is equal to something that I already knew at the previous step. Okay, so that's called an iteration. And let's see, let's go back here. So the fact that we can always do this is just the statement that Laplacian minus lambda uh, is invertible because lambda is a positive number. And so the, the real interest is inequality. So the claim is that all of these things stay sandwiched in between u lower bar and u upper bar. Please. Okay, so it doesn't really matter here because, uh, so, and I'm definitely sloughing over the regularity issues. So, you know, I can assume everything is smooth, so I work in, you know, CK alpha. So let me defer that for a little moment, but let's say you do it in LP or L2 or something like that. It doesn't matter very much. The important things here, of course, is that at the end of the day, because this is an elliptic equation, if, let's suppose that I've found U lower bar and it's smooth, right? then the solution of this is, and as long as capital F is a smooth function, then this guy will be smooth. So you solve it in some space and then apply elliptic regularity. Okay. Now I'm assuming, and I'm happy to sort of talk a bit more about general elliptic regularity. I'm going to be talking about it specifically in this context of conic singularities, but um, anybody want me to say a few more words about that? I'd be happy to. Okay. So, uh, so you do this, and these all follow by the maximum principle. So let me just sort of do one of these, just for, uh, for instance, right? So if I take uj plus 1 minus uj, right, this is going to be Laplace minus lambda inverse of f tilde of x uj minus f tilde of x uj minus 1. Now, this thing here, so I carefully arrange things, so that's monotone decreasing. By induction, so I'm going to do this by induction, by induction, uj is greater than or equal to uj minus 1, which means that this is less than or equal to 0. Okay? And then, well, here's the point, is that Laplacian minus lambda and its inverse are, you know, what's called, well, positivity preserving, but of course that's a misnomer. It ch makes positive curvature and positive signs into negative signs. So I'll remind you why that's true in just a second. So this whole thing, so I claim that this whole thing is greater than or equal to zero, and that's the inductive step. Okay, so why is that true? So what I'm really claiming, I can see from two points of view, and I'll remind you both points of view. Okay, oops, let me go up a little bit. So I'll remind you two points of view. The first is, that uh, if I have, let's say, Laplacian minus lambda v is equal to f, so if I have uh, Laplacian minus lambda of v is equal to f, and let's suppose the f is greater than or equal to zero, right? then I claim that v, so that was the hard part here is remembering what happened. So if f is greater than or equal to zero, then I, I claim that this means that uh, v has no, um, uh, which way do I want it here? Uh, um, so it's a sub-solution. So v has no, so v does not reach a positive maximum. V does not reach, so the, the soup of v is less than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's the maximum principle. Well, so that's just noticing that Laplacian v is greater than or equal to lambda v. Right? And if the supremum were strictly positive, then lambda v would be strictly positive, but the Laplacian at a maximum has to be less than or equal to zero. 
Okay, so that's one point of view. The other point of view is that if I take the integral kernel for Laplacian minus lambda, so suppose I write Laplacian minus lambda inverse applied to any function f is equal to the integral of g, maybe I'll call it g lambda, of x, y, f of y, dy. Okay. So this is the Green's function at energy lambda, or however you want to call it. Then this g lambda, just point-wise, is less than zero. Of course, it has a singularity when x equals y, but point-wise, it's less than zero. Okay. Well, you have to prove that. One way of proving that is sort of an analog of this result. Or you can relate it to something that's arguably even more elementary, which is the uh, heat kernel. So I can write g lambda is equal to minus the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus lambda t times, well, I'll write sort of provocatively, e to the Laplacian t dt. So this is the heat kernel, h of txy. Okay, that's the integral kernel. If I put a dollop of heat, a, a delta function of heat at y, and I wait for time t, then that's how much heat persists at, at the position x. Okay, so again, there's a maximum principle at work. This is a strictly positive quantity. I'm integrating against an exponentially decreasing but strictly positive guy from zero to infinity, and I have to take a minus sign because the zero is on the lower limit of integration. So this just looks like thinking of the Laplacian as a number, so this is really a, a functional calculus statement, but it's true, okay? And it's true point-wise, in fact. You know, if I put in arbitrary values of x and y not equal to each other, this is, a, this is an equality. Yeah, please. Yeah? Well, so what I'm doing is I have a different right hand and left hand side, right? So, you know, I'm solving this equation. Laplacian minus lambda uj plus 1 is equal to f tilde of x uj. Of course, this is the same as what I just wrote down. But I assume that I've already figured out what uj is inductively. And then I find a new function uj plus 1. Okay? So they're different. And I keep on stepping up and I find new ones. Okay? Okay, good. Okay, so I find these functions and they satisfy this chain of inequalities. So what? Well, yeah. Okay, so they satisfy this chain of inequalities. I'm just applying arguments like this again and again. It's an easy exercise. And so what I get is that u, which is equal to the pointwise limit of uj. So I'm doing the most unsophisticated kind of thing that we teach our real analysis students not to do with functions, right? Just take the pointwise limit. That's usually a disaster right, because we know nothing about the pointwise limit except for that it's bounded, okay, it's an L-infinity function. That's all I know about it, because it's bounded between U lower bar and U upper bar, okay. However, what I know about it is that, so, Laplacian minus lambda of this U is equal to F tilde of X and U, well, this right-hand side it's just, I mean, f is a smooth function, so I can just take the pointwise limit of f of x uj, and it converges to that. How can I differentiate this thing? Well, you know, if you're like me, think of this as a distribution, and then you can differentiate anything, right? So you can think of this as just a distributional equation. Okay, so I think of u as this, as a, as a distribution on m, and the right-hand side, a priori, is just an L-infinity. And then I apply iterative elliptic regularity, so the first thing I do is note that this is going to tell me that uh, this equation says that any distribution which satisfies that equation has to be better than it looks. It has to have two derivatives in L infinity. So, so U is in W2 infinity. Okay, so that's kind of a weird function space. It just means two derivatives in L infinity. But in particular, that means that, uh, and in fact, let's just be safe, call this two derivatives in LP for all P less than infinity. Right? This is going to say that u is in C1 alpha, the holder space, C1 alpha. Right? And now the right-hand side is in C1 alpha, and u has two derivatives as it's Laplacian in C1 alpha. That's an a, 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 a space in which I can apply regularity. So now I'm saying that uh, you know, Laplacian of u is in C1 alpha. That's going to tell me that u is in C3 alpha, etc. So I keep on bootstrapping, and I get eventually that u is in C infinity. So I found a solution. 
OK, and moreover, the solution is unique. So if I have two solutions, Laplacian u is equal to f of x u, and Laplacian of v is equal to f of x v. And maybe, excuse me, I want to do this with the uh, monotone guys just to be safe. Laplacian minus lambda. And what I mean, Laplacian minus lambda of v is equal to that. I take the difference, Laplacian minus lambda of u minus v, right, is equal to f tilde, this is f tildes now, of x u minus f tilde of x v. And I apply the same sort of ideas that if u is ever bigger than v, then I look at the supremum of u minus v. This right hand side is positive, and then that contradicts the same sort of argument that I did before that the Laplacian has to be less than or equal to zero at a supremum of u minus v. Okay, so u minus v is both less than or equal to zero and greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Okay, so that's, like I say, an old argument going back. 50 years or so, but it's still a very powerful one when you can make it work. So we've completely solved the uniformization theorem in, in, a, uh, in the zero and negative cases now, okay, in the compact case. Okay, so let me say a few words about the spherical case, but pr quickly move on to the conic um, situation, which is more, uh, a bit more challenging. So the spherical case, so the reality, which we know from uh, complex analysis is that any metric whatsoever on the sphere is conformal to a constant curvature metric. There's only one conformal class. Okay? And you can prove this by you know, finding a certain sort of holomorphic function. Um, from So if I have an M, what I really would want to do, and there's, this is sort of a classic thing, is if an M is, looks like the sphere, then, well, let's see, what do I want to say? Um, so I, I'd want to find a holomorphic function from this onto the complex plane. So holomorphic that has a uh, simple pole at, at P. And you can find such things, okay? I mean, there's sort of a, a standard tricks to do. If we were to look at this from the PDE point of view, Laplacian U minus K naught plus E to the 2U. So this is one of these things that, you know, it's sort of good pondering. You do something incredibly minor looking, like change a minus sign into a plus sign, and it just screws everything up, okay? Namely, this method of sub and super solutions just fails. You know, you can try to apply it and things don't quite work. And you think, well, I could just work a little bit harder and make them work somehow. It just won't work. And the reason is, is that there are families of solutions. Well, it's a little bit um, contradictory, but there are too many solutions here is the reason it doesn't work. So, in fact, it turns out that there are solutions that, so here's the sphere. It turns out there are solutions of this problem which kind of bulge at one point. They kind of bubble at one side and, you know, get very small at another side. I'm not going to say too much about this point of view, but uh, the fact that you have a non-compact family of solutions. So where these solutions come from is pretty easy. I just take a conformal transformation, just a dilation on the sphere that sort of sucks the south pole to the north pole, or you know any pole to any other pole, and I pull back the round metric with that. I get that's always conformal to the round metric, and I get a family of functions which get larger and larger as I take a stronger and stronger dilation. They all satisfy this equation. And though that's not directly contradicting the fact that I might use sub and super solutions, that turns out to be, you know, really, um, uh, it, it really screws things up. And so the, the method just doesn't work. Now, um, I'm not going to sort of give you uh, full details of the proof that you can just solve this equation by hand for any function k naught that integrates to the right thing, namely 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, namely 4 pi. And, but the way that you do this is that you do this variationally. So you use the calculus of variations. So variational ideas. So namely, what I want to do is I want to look at the energy, 1 half times the integral of rad u squared. Um, so then I'm going to have to do plus minus the integral of k naught times u. And I want to uh, find the, uh, I want to find u such that this thing is minimized but I want to do this subject to the fact that the integral of e to the 2u is fixed. Let's say is always equal to 1. This is da0. OK, so this is a variational problem. So in other words, I look at this functional here, and I look on a nonlinear constraint set. So this is some big infinite, co infinite dimensional manifold in the space of all u's. In fact, it has co-dimension 1, so it's this huge hypersurface in the space of all u's. 
And somewhere on there, I want to find the minimum of this functional. Now, why does it do the right thing? Well, if I take the Euler-Lagrange equation of this, which uh, I'll compute for you tomorrow, and use this as a Lagrange multiplier, I get exactly that equation. Okay? How does the plus sign come out? Well, it's this minus sign here. Right? And that minus sign means that this is possibly unbounded below, and you run into all sorts of problems about why can you even find a minimum, and so on. Whereas if this were a plus sign, which would be that being a minus sign, the negative case, this would be easy. Okay. Okay, so there's a whole line of work that sort of goes here, and this turns out to be a somewhat delicate variational problem, precisely because there are too many solutions, right? It's always this sort of anomalous thing. If you have this big, non-compact family of minimizers, it's very hard to find them, variationally, because, you know, you take a minimizing sequence and it can go off to infinity. Okay, okay so there's sort of a whole line of work there, which I am not going to be pursuing very much in these lectures, but I just want to mention this. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, let me just set these problems up now for the uh, conic case. Oops, oops, hold on. And then tell you what I'm really interested in and why I'm doing all So the first thing is a theorem that kind of completely settles the problem I stated um, in one specific case. So here's a theorem by uh, Bob McCohen, and it was proved in about um, 1981, I think. And what he proved is that um, the, uh, the, the main problem is solvable if the corresponding curvature is less than zero, or equivalently, there's a number which is the conic Euler characteristic, chi, and I'm going to call this chi beta, beta less than zero. Okay, so there's a condition which is just like an Euler characteristic condition, and provided that simple number is zero is negative, this is just a combinatorial thing, then I can always solve this problem for any cone angle. Okay, and the method of proof is going to be just that. We have to set it up properly, and there's some new details which I want to describe, but that's it, the whole solution. Okay. The k equals zero case turns out to be even easier, as usual. It's just a linear problem. And the k positive case is the one that's still open and unsolved, and it has a lot of subtleties. Okay, and that sort of relates to what I'm talking about over here. Now, I want to sort of conclude today by talking, first of all, what this conic Euler characteristic is, and then secondly, um, sort of why there's still interesting things to say even in the negative case. Okay, so what is, so suppose I have any conic surface so maybe there's some handles in here, but there's a finite number of conic singularities. Okay, I'd like to compute the conic Euler characteristic. So what that means is I want to take the integral. So I want to take m minus the union of balls. j goes from 1 to k, and I just want to take epsilon balls around these points pj. Okay, so I'm just excising balls here. Okay. Now, on this surface, I want to apply the ordinary garden variety gauss binet theorem on a, man on a surface with boundary. Okay, so I'm going to have the integral of kda on this m sub epsilon. I'm going to call this m sub epsilon. And that's going to be the integral over the boundary of m sub epsilon of something plus uh, the Euler characteristic of this thing. So 2 pi, and then I'm going to have chi of m and every time I've removed a disk, it subtracts one from the Euler characteristic. So I have 2 pi of chi of m minus k. Okay. So, uh, so the whole issue is what is the boundary contribution? Now, the proof is, you know, the various ways of uh, doing this. But so this, this uh, boundary contribution, the integral of boundary of m sub epsilon, so this thing, so there are various ways of how you might write this. What this thing does, so this is going to be asymptotically the same, no matter what this conic metric is, to the corresponding contribution on a flat cone. Okay, so this is going to be a sum, j goes from 1 to k, of integrals around little circles, and I'm going to have this corresponding, so if you like, this is a circle with cone angle 2 pi alpha j. 
Okay? Now, there are various ways of writing down this contribution, but it's essentially the holonomy around that. Uh, it's the parallel transport around there. So this is just going to be the sum of 2 pi times alpha j. Okay? So what I'm left with altogether is that the integral of kda is going to be 2 pi times the sum j goes from 1 to k of alpha j minus 1 plus 2 pi chi of m. And so I call this number chi of m beta. So I'm going to switch parameters now is equal to chi of m plus the sum of the beta j's where each beta j, this just turns out to be a more convenient parameter, alpha j minus 1. Okay, so it's a way of writing it. And so the theorem of McCohen's is that this is a necessary condition. If I'm going to have negative curvature, you know, if k is everywhere negative, right, then this right-hand side better be negative, and he says that's a necessary and sufficient condition. Okay? Proof is same kind of boneheaded stuff, though we have to worry about how do we solve Laplacians and conic manifolds, and I'll be telling you about that in nauseating detail. Okay? Uh, so that's one thing. And then, and then uh, I promised you that there are some interesting questions here. And so here are the questions that I want to get to by the end of the week. So I can find a solution with singularities. Now, sort of the, the frontier of this problem is the frontier of what happens here, namely what happens when the points coalesce. So what we're after is sort of a very accurate analysis of what happens when you have clusters of conic singularities that, that vanish, I mean, that, that coalesce into one point, OK? Um, so we know that there's always solutions by McCohen's general theorem, but something horrible happens to them. I mean, they're going to converge to something with conic singularities. I'd like very precise information on how that happens. Right? Now, why do I care about that so much? Well, it's emblematic of a lot of problems where you are, have clustering singularities and you're interested. Let me give you two examples and I'll stop there. One example is suppose you have a holomorphic quadratic differential on a surface and you look at a family of such things where the zeros are clustering together. Okay? How do you sort of understand the fine asymptotics of that? Now, there's old work on this that actually Alex pointed out to me. It was solved by my colleague Halsey Royden, you know, 40 years ago. Um, but in fact, we have a very interesting new approach on sort of how to understand those asymptotics. Okay? Another problem, this comes out of quantum mechanics, really. Suppose you have a bunch of Coulomb potentials. You have a Schrodinger operator with Coulomb potentials. You have, you know, 1 over mod x singularities, and they're all clustering. You know, you have a bunch of particles which are very close together. What happens? How do you analyze the fine spectral theory of that? So the tools I'll be describing give you uh, a way of understanding that, and this is just sort of the easiest kind of model case to understand things like that. Okay, okay so I'll stop there for today. So yes, I mean, so the, the, the right question is, given a collection of k distinct points in the surface, how do you compactify the, the, the space of k distinct unordered points in the surface? Now, there's complex ways of doing that, I mean, you know, complex geometric ways of doing that, which I don't want to do. So what I want to do is define a real manifold with corners which describes the compactified configuration space. So that turns out to sort of describe all possible ways that these points can come together, right? And then sort of the theorem I'm after is saying that on that compactified configuration space, I have a universal curve, which is over every divisor, I have the curve M, you know, and it's sort of changing as the points move around. And that itself, you know, as the points cluster, you know, that, that uh, has itself kind of a complicated resolution as a real manifold with corners. So I have some very complicated geometric object. It has a lot of boundary faces and so on, but it describes all possible ways that points can come together. And I'd like to understand this family of metrics on that space. 